Um, so generally, in understanding microbial threats, critical questions that usually arise are the what, whens, and hows. Uh, and as an economist, um, we're really interested in answering the what, when, and how in a slightly different context. Uh, so specifically in the context of the, uh, the economics of managing these threats. So here what I'm talking about is what is the value of managing, not just where these uh, risks are coming from. Um, second, when should we invest in management, not when will an outbreak occur. Uh, and third, um, how should we build a management framework to cost effectively and just effectively in general address these risks. Uh, and then within this framework, is there a place for One Health to um, cost-effectively approach um, some of these emerging infectious diseases that um, um, cost us a lot of money? Um, so zoonotic emerging infectious diseases may be one area where we can use a One Health framework um, to assist in preventing uh, future events um, through early detection uh, and rapid response, but also, also through preventing that uh, infection from occurring in the first place. So uh, just over the past half century, we've observed a rise in the number of zoonotic emerging infectious disease events, uh, specifically the number that have uh, emerged from wildlife sources. Um, so using a One Health framework that targets these specific sources of risk, not only animals, but wildlife, and potentially even livestock, um, may have some benefit in terms of some sort of cost-effective strategy for uh, addressing risk here. Um, so what's the value of investing in a framework or thinking about a framework for manage the, managing these risks from sort of an in, interdisciplinary perspective? Well, the goal would be to change this exponential trend that we're seeing in emerging infectious disease events. So the value of investing in management or, or thinking about managing these problems early on or before they even occur would be changing the, the exponential trend in that function. But it's not so simple as uh, how do we invest or how much do we invest in uh, emerging infectious disease risks. The problem is these risks are dynamic. They're changing with agricultural intensification, globalization, uh, the way that you and I interact with food and people on the streets. Um, this risk is evolving over time. And uh, in my last slide, I showed that the risk of emerging infectious disease uh, is increasing. So this makes this question, not just a matter of um, what's the value of doing X at any point in time, but rather it's the what is the value of doing X at time T. So we know that these risks are increasing over time, uh, and therefore timing in implementing any sort of management plan, either prevent preventive or ad adaptive, um, is really important. Uh, and across literatures, uh, we've seen that prevention is more cost effective than uh, response. Uh, and this is no exception. With that said, in terms of timing, setting up a framework for management early uh, on, as early as we possibly can, is best. Um, you get the most bang for your buck this way. Um, if these risks, again, are increasing over time, the longer we wait, the more we'll pay in damages as we sort of sort out these problems. Um, but that said, waiting for some time, so evaluating options and, and strategies for implementing frameworks is also okay, but up until a point. There's a threshold where the expected damages for the, the projections um, of future events uh, exceeds whatever we'll get from investing in a preventative framework or early response framework um, for managing these risks. So just in sum, we can wait. Early, investing early is better, but we better not wait too long to, to sort this out. So then finally, once we understand how timing fits into this problem, um, the final question is, how can we design these policies to effectively uh, address the risks? Um, so just taking the amount of money that the US appropriated uh, for addressing Ebola, $5.4 billion, uh, and thinking about um, before the outbreak occurred, how could that sum of money have been spent to um, either prevent the outbreak from happening in the first place or rapidly responding to the outbreak um, by mobilizing capital and labor to the source of that outbreak um, to mitigate the damages um, of, of that outbreak? Uh, so we did some analysis here and found that if $1 billion were invested up front in some sort of mobile capital framework, a network of 
labs and surveillance teams uh, in high-risk areas um, and just across the globe. Um, in, in addition to uh, trained technicians that can perform surveillance, um, can employ best management practices, um, and mobilize again to move to areas where uh, an outbreak has occurred um, to respond to that outbreak quickly um, would be a better investment than just waiting for an outbreak to occur and spending uh, five and a half million dollars uh, cleaning it up. Um, so if we invest a billion dollars in this network today and then uh, invest also in keeping that technology and that training up to date, so about 50 million dollars a year um, for the foreseeable future, um, we found that that will result in a savings of about $11 billion. So how specifically then can a One Health approach, One Health is sort of been underlying the things that I've been talking about so far, but how specifically can a One Health approach be implemented um, in this uh, knowing that uh, investing early um, and thinking about timing and how risk changes over time um, how can One Health promote best management practices uh, in both production and industry, so the livestock industry, and also extractive industries that spend a lot of time um, in habitats, uh, wildlife habitats? Um, here's another idea. Rather than just foc focusing on the private sector and uh, publishing best management practices, what if there were significant overlaps between multiple global issues? Uh, we know that emerging health risks are a significant uh, potentially economic burden, uh, but land use change um, is another sort of hot global issue currently for a number of reasons. And we've identified that there's this link between land use change, interactions with wildlife, and emerging diseases in humans. So is there a way that we can combine this information um, to better address threats through a One Health framework? So in some of the work that I've done with collaborators, we've designed this decision-making framework that weighs the trade-offs of land use change and land conversion with conservation. Um, and what we're after here is really understanding how much land should be converted in any given year, in any given period of time, um, that considers all the costs and benefits of that action. Uh, so for example, the benefits are sort of obvious from an economic standpoint. That would be industry, economic growth, jobs. But the costs are not so obvious, and that's still what we're trying to wrap our heads around um, as ecologists and epidemiologists. Um, and these are the ecosystem services that we lose by converting landscapes. Um, and in, in particular, one that we're arguing has been ignored in the land use change discussion so far is disease regulation. So we've developed this framework for analyzing trade-offs between uh, land conversion and conservation. And we've applied this model to uh, both the Brazilian Amazon uh, and Malaysian Borneo uh, with data collected on the ground. Uh, and what we're finding, which is not terribly surprising, is decision makers, industry, when left to their own devices to decide how much land they want to convert in a given year, is ignoring the externalities of the actions. They're not thinking about the ecosystem services that we all benefit from um, that we're losing when land is converted. And in particular, they're not thinking about um, the, the cost of increased uh, disease incidence in these decisions. So we can develop these models to give policymakers kind of a perspective of how much um, ecosystem services are valued uh, in terms of conservation and from a health perspective. So just to conclude, we see this huge opportunity for both research and policy development um, using a One Health approach to managing multiple global issues uh, at the same time. Um, and so here are just a few concluding points. Um, first, we really need to understand um, what these threats cost. Um, if something hasn't emerged yet, it's really hard to identify how much it's actually going to cost us. Um, but not just treatment. We also really need to think about the total economic costs, direct and indirect, of uh, continued and increasing emerging infectious disease events. Um, and this is going to help inform uh, and value potential policy options. So given that there's this global discussion of the importance of land use change and even climate change policy, uh, we really think this is an appropriate time to communicate what we know about the lost ecosystem services of things like land use change um, and sort of builds this discussion um, about health, of the importance of health in the decisions that we make on a global scale uh, and also create, uh, create incentives 
um, that can affect change. So thank you.